So uh, looking at photographs again, and I've added that again as a way of thinking about we're revisiting Victor Bergin's essay, but also there's something about the fact that we look at photographs again and again and again, and, and, and that's the conceit here. And I, I want to talk about um, a number of photographers, practitioners, I'll show you some work as I have done in the past. And what I hope you can do is if you're inspired by them, go away and find out more. They're not the kind of, they're, they're, they're just the kind of sample images of these photographers. Uh, but I just want to introduce you as we've, we've been doing each week to a few more uh, photographers and some of the same ones as well, but just different different work. And I will talk about each of those as we go through. So, OK, so in this lecture, I take as my point of departure Victor Bergen's essay, looking at photographs, which, as I said, there was a link in the in the um, invitation here to a PDF if you want to read that. Um, looking at photographs appeared in um, the book Thinking Photography, which was edited by Victor Bergen, and I believe that was published uh, in the late 70s, nine, early 80s, actually, when I was at university. So in terms of this module, what I want, I, I want to help you to think about photographs and give you some pointers in order to write about them uh, in, 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 the, in the written piece that you're going to be doing at the end of this module, but also later on in the dissertation, so next year. So we're kind of preempting all the writing, and this is how you need to engage with academic writing and academic, academic conversations about images. And I think also for those of you that do attend my professional practice lectures on, on, on a Wednesday, I think you can see that that Confidence uh, is something that's come up a few times. Confidence about your yourselves, but actually confidence about talking about your work. I think some of these processes, some of these ways of articulating about photography and about image um, are hopefully uh, contributing to the confidence factor that, that, that we're trying to build in you. And what we may well do, uh, this is kind of open to discussion, but I may well get you to start to present some of your ideas um, rather than just written form, but actually do some presentations uh, to the group or to small groups about particular work that you're interested in. So I'm trying to give you some thoughts uh, about how representations work in this discussion, uh, in this lecture, and I'm going to update and apply some of Bergen's ideas to our own experiences. Now, Bergen's essay talks about semiotics and it talks about other things which are all absolutely useful and interesting, and I will hopefully cover those. This is not an in-depth sort of parallel reading of looking at photographs. I simply feel that th that essay uh, when I was an undergraduate, that was kind of an essay that I, I you know, we were talking and discussing for photography at the time. Um, and I felt that that, that that essay was a kind of inroad into the language and into the way in which we could start to discuss and think about photography. So it was, it was kind of useful for me. So Bergen begins by describing how photographs are things that we see every day in many different contexts. Uh, since, since they are so familiar to us, we end up understanding them as everyday objects of which there is nothing to explain. So in this sense, um, what we're saying here, or what Bergen's making the claim, is that if you see something a lot, and if you experience something a lot, it becomes part of the everyday experience of your life such that you almost overlook it. I think that overlooking is quite a, a useful way of way of thinking about this. So imagine, um, and I, I you appreciate we've, we've had COVID and you probably haven't been on a tube train and we live in Birmingham anyway, so this is, <laughs> this is kind of a slightly separate sort of image but if you're if you're on the tube and you see images and you're walking around you're on a bus you're going walking around Birmingham you're seeing images all the time um, we start to not be conscious of our experience with images and I'm not going to say reading images or looking at images but we look at them in a very casual way but and and I think it's fair to say if you think about an experience when um when you're aware of it, it's often when things are disrupted. So, for example, once we moved online, everyone became aware of 
online teaching being different from being in the classroom now we're probably a little bit more used to it and it feels a bit more comfortable and it fits in with our life so this idea of images fitting in images being part of uh, bogan uses the term the daily instrumentality of photography to indicate how they operate in our lives without us questioning how they operate and this was the this was bogan's project in the 1970s and 80s was actually to say it's a again, kind of at the forefront of photographic theory so he's the one that you you can blame for all these these lectures in some sense um and uh what he was trying to do is understand how photographs operate what what they do and it's it's kind of more what they do than what they mean although obviously what they mean contributes to what they do so we have these kind of these these slightly attention between those uh those kinds of analysis um and and i want you to be aware of that because there's there's kind of meaning and there's shall we say operation so meaning of an image and then what it actually does yeah so we're going to try and try and keep those terms in mind so essentially photographs have increasingly become a background a wallpaper that surrounds and covers over our experiences of the world but they also stand in for some of the experiences we have so uh, they provide us with a mediated world as picture or the world seen as representation so what what i mean by this is that we see the world depicted to us through a number of through through the photographs that we see uh, we've got magazines here but we might see and and i i think it's important to stress that by, by photographs we can probably broadly mean moving image as well you know we watch youtube we see tv we see clips of things even on newspaper websites now uh you know the short video clips that we're experiencing so let's let's just kind of free frame this photographic term and kind of use it as image and that could be moving or still and i think that's an important distinction to kind of say actually now everything that we should be concerned about is the image in in the form that we experience it so not just a still image not just a moving image so we see the world as a as a wallpaper in terms of these images so things that are just there and incidental to us um but they also represent things so they make us um they re reinforce our ideas about how things look or how things should look and then they also mediate the world so instead of us having to go on holiday we can just look at photographs of or or images of holidays and instead of going on a cruise liner we can look at somebody's somebody's video of their their holiday on that cruise liner and feel like we experience it in the same way um perhaps the most obvious uh, um example of kind of re-experiencing something that we don't necessarily go out and experience would be kind of photojournalism or, do, or that kind of documentary style photography um, and perhaps at the extreme that would be like war or, or conflict so we don't necessarily want to go there but we want to kind of see what it's like so we, we we get shown those things and we feel like we can have some empathy or some relationship to to the experience even if we've not been there of course um, that's deeply questionable as as you probably are already thinking that the experience of image is different from the experience of reality now philosophically speaking what we might say is that reality becomes more like image uh, in some sense the more images that we see but that's not what we're talking about today so the study of um the study of photography, uh, sorry, just move on slides. The study of photography alongside learning creative techniques and practices, so going into the studio, doing the kinds of things that you're, you're doing in the workshops, in addition to understanding the historical context of the, of the subject, so what we've done before about where photography came from historically, is also about what photographs do. So it's really important to understand that this as it were, the operation of photography or images is really a useful area of inquiry and study for you as photographic scholars. Um, and by this, I mean how they operate in our society. 
So if that too much, if that sounds a little bit too much like an academic study, then perhaps it is enough to ask what's actually going on when we look at photographs. And to be clear, I think what I, I what I want you to understand is we look at photographs either consciously. So we go to a gallery, we might go to an exhibition and sit and uh, you know, walk around, look at things on the wall, or we might just experience them as we pass through, as I said, the tube station, or we're sitting on the bus, or we're just leafing through a magazine and seeing all these images pass over us. Of course, I'm kind of omitted to use the obvious one, but you know, swiping through our phone, which I'm going to talk about as well in a little bit later. So photographs sell us things. They, as for, they inform us about events, they record and they delight us. And, and as they do this, they construct a visual world of representation, which we all start to recognize. So we recognize the world as image and we recognize the world outside of images, but we recognize that world as an image. So I'm sure all of you will have gone somewhere and thought that would make a nice photograph. And in some sense, what you're doing is you're looking at the world as if it were a photograph. You're looking at the, at the photographic potential of the world. And in some sense, that, that process is informed by the photographs you've seen before. And it's also informed by all the images, all the things you've seen before, particularly aesthetics, I guess, in, in some respects. So the typical kind of landscape spot or the tourist site where we would go and here's a great place where you should take photographs, that kind of thing. You know, from here, you will get a great photograph. Um, I always think it'd be really nice to um, not go to the places where everybody usually takes photographs from and try and find somewhere else, find a different angle, find a different perspective. So those are the kinds of things that as photographers scholars you might want to interrogate and think through a little bit more um, uh, more deliberately increasingly our lives are framed by interactions with all kinds of different images in the digital world these images are linked to data they are fed and informed by our choices uh, they're fed by our habits and by the kinds of things that we do in the real world and and you're all aware of the kind of targeted advertising that is more and more uh, our our everyday experience of, of the internet so you go onto facebook or you go onto a, a a website with advertising and the thing that you were searching for comes up in all the adverts so that targeting have advertising and often that's done through images so whatever you're looking at suddenly becomes articulated in the form of adverts in order to encourage you potentially to go and buy them, buy the things that you're looking at or engage with the things that you're looking at. So this is the world of the networked image, which is orientated around production, distribution and sharing of photographs and has in essence been fueled by the mobile phone or the mobile devices, I guess we might call it the computer that happens to be able to, you know, um, make phone calls, but also does all kinds of other things. So really important to think about production, making work, distributing it, so uploading it, and then sharing it. So people looking at it, uh, looking at that work and reacting to it. I guess that that, that, that will be an important uh, aspect of that. So we have these three steps in the digital world. And I think what's also important within that is this understanding of how the photograph, the image, as it were, is connected through each of those processes in very different ways, in slightly different ways. So in the production sense, it's kind of connected to you and the software that you use and the platforms that you upload it to. Then in the distribution, it's about the, the kind of the, the take up of those platforms and maybe your network of people that interact with it. And then it's what they do with it. So the analytics, the OK, people react, they share, they, they, they like, they comment, they they engage with it in some way. And we have a full sense of activity. Um, Slavoj Žižek calls it some of that pseudo pseudo activity. So this this idea that we we feel like we're doing something when we're doing that, and uh, and particularly when we're scrolling through others other people's images, we feel like we've got a purpose in life that we're doing it in some in some way that's meaningful. And um, 
I guess there's an argument to say that the, that, that the meaningfulness of doing that could be brought into question if we really if we really want to take some some stock of that. So, um, OK, here, here's uh, here's our old favourite now. Hopefully uh, no one's surprised by Gursky coming up in one of my presentations. So Bergin suggests that photography is situated between two mediums. As single images, photographs are inevitably compared to paintings and to the art world in general. And I, I, I'm using Gursky as an example here, and this is his exhibition at the Hayward Gallery in London in 2018. And you can see these are photographs, but they're presented in a way in a gallery, a gallery space, that these are kind of interchangeable with what we might have originally experienced as, as painting. So the, 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 as it were, the traditional understanding of the art world and immediately once you do that once you locate photographs inside that context and you do the things that 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 match that context so you put frames around them you make them large you put them in walls you you uh spread them out uh you you invite people in to a gallery you know you make it a a, a gallery I'm, I'm going to use a word, I'll make up a word, gallerific. <laughs> I'm sure I've just made that up. A kind of gallery space. Um, once you do that, you're, you're signalling the, as it were, the codes and the conventions of the art world, the traditional art world. And and for photography, that's a, that's almost like, um, I guess that's a, a reference back to the things we've talked about, the struggles of photography to make sense of itself uh, as an arts practice. So maybe we have to go to more effort with photography to situate it within the art world. Um, that's my, my, my thought. So the single image photographs are inevitably compared to paintings and to the art world. In its use of camera and film processes, photography is also linked to cinema and moving image. And, and, and Bergen um, talks about this, but he was obviously writing before digital technology. And I think now, the link, the link between moving image is much more accepted. And, and by moving image, I guess we have to sort of open up that field and go and talk about cinema, but also talk about Netflix and YouTube and Amazon Prime and any of the other sources where, you know, TikTok and um, the reels on uh, Instagram and Snapchat and all, all those kinds of mediums that are mixing those things up and presenting us with with kind of true, true in the true sense, multimedia. So media that is of multiple forms, music, sound, image. And, and, and so we encounter images in, in different forms along that way. So we have the, the single stilled image, the, the revered artwork of Gursky, you know, the, 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 the cost and the quality of that work against this kind of the, the cacophony and the noise of, 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 of media in, in the sense of being bombarded with that, that MTV we talked about, and uh, David Roderick talking about the figure or the, the MTV bombardment of text and image and sound coming at us and consuming us, overwhelming us in some sense. So crucially, what Berging argues is that photographs are not experienced in the way that we tend to experience paintings or cinema. So mostly we we experience photographs outside of the Haywood Gallery, outside of the Photographer's Gallery, outside of a, a, a an event of art, and we experience them in this kind of internet way. We've got Pinterest here. Um, so he's, uh, Bergen suggests that we choose to see paintings in a gallery or movies in a cinema, whereas photographs are, are usually not seen as part of a, any deliberate choice. Much of our experience of photography is in some way forced upon us or it creeps up without us knowing. And I think targeting advertising is the most obvious way that that happens. But, you know, you could imagine scrolling through your phone on Instagram is a way in which you don't know what images are going to come into your onto your screen. You're just kind of scrolling through. OK, you 
you curate the choices of images, but then you get all these extra ones like this, you might be interested in this, or this is promoted, et cetera, et cetera. So images kind of creep, creep up on us. I think that that, that might be a way of uh, um, thinking about that. So we do not allocate a particular time to see a photograph, and nor is there a set time in order for us to experience it. We do not ask how long is a photograph, and Ber Bergen talks about this quite a lot. Um, where if, if you go and listen to his lectures, he he talks about this idea that when you go to a gallery, you you don't ask how long is the exhibition. You you go in and you you take your time, or maybe like me, I I tend to rush through exhibitions. I don't know why. It's like I rush through eating food, so I I go and I kind of look fairly rapidly, but some people spend a lot of time, they ponder that, but but you might ask, how long is that film? How long is that movie? How long is this program? When's it on? Mm, we, we ask that less and less now with streamed, always available content, and there's, there's a paper in there somewhere. While a painting or a movie can be considered as an object in and of itself, photographs, uh, Bergen suggests that photographs are often experienced and this is an important word, or an, a, an important phrase rather, as an environment. So he says they circulate amongst us and deliver a set of meanings that we interpret as a kind of language. So you'll hear a lot of people talk about the language of photography, and I'm, I'm even going to use those words uh, here, but, but in some ways Photographs don't operate in the same way as a language. They operate, and here I'm going to borrow from Jacques Lacan, they operate like a language. Um, so they're not a language in and of themselves, but they have they take on some of the principles of language. And if you ever think about language and words, um, and uh, that can be quite an interesting exercise to understand how we how we recognize language. And we have a shared language, English, and you understand the words that I'm saying, but you don't implicitly, within my words, isn't contained meaning. Meaning is there for you to unpack and unravel later. We'll, we'll maybe talk about language on a, another lecture when we talk about linguistics and the linguistic sign and things like that. So um, images, think of the images as an environment rather than going to the photographer's gallery and seeing photographs in a deliberate way. Uh, think of images as being around us and consuming us as we consume them. So let's begin with some thoughts about photographs. Uh, firstly, how do we read or how do we ascertain meaning from a photograph? So generally what we, happens when we interpret what we see visually is we read a photograph like a text. Again, I'm, I'm urging you to be cautious over my claims of a language of photography, but it's a useful vehicle for us to begin with. So read this like a text, like we would read a book, like we would read, or like I'm reading words on a page. So in other words, what we're doing when we're looking at photographs is decoding the visual contents of, an Im of, of a photograph or an image. We look at what photographs show us and we construct a narrative about what it is that we are seeing. And I'm sure you've, while I've been talking, you've been looking at this image, well, at least I hope you have, and you've constructed some kind of image narrative from it. It may not be the correct narrative, that word correct is, is also a, a, a problematic term. It may not be the narrative that everybody else or the consensus agrees with, but it might be a narrative informed by your own culture or your own experiences or by your knowledge of this image or by your knowledge as photographic scholars. And hopefully those things will come into play in the way that language, if you learn a new language, uh, or if you speak another language, and I'm sure some of you do, um, your command of that language is, is, is different depending on your experiences and whether you've lived in that country, whether it's your native language, or whether you, on how you've learned that language in and of itself. I don't 
uh, don't speak any other languages very well at all. I just have a, a small f uh, phrases that I can manage to get by with. And I find that very, very difficult and um, disappointing in myself for not being able to speak other languages. So, um, OK, all phot photographs signify to us through different codes. For example, focus. And here I've got an example of focus, um, shallow depth of field. Um, I think bokeh, some people call it, um, you know, narrow depth of field. iPhone will call it portrait mode, portrait mode, uh, the language of photography. Um, so this is the code, the code of focus, the shallow depth of field. And, and to us as photographic scholars, we, and, and photographic technicians, we should recognize this and we probably try to achieve it in certain ways and you probably know about long lenses and wide open apertures and expensive lenses that give you wide open apertures and sometimes people will refer to those as fast lenses and what they mean by that is that you can use a fast shutter speed because they have a wide open aperture so they let more light in or you need less light to use that lens than you would another lens. And the reason those lenses are more expensive is because the aperture has to be wider, which means the lens has to be manufactured to with a more precise uh, form across the whole piece of glass so that the lens is crisp and sharp. See, we've gone into a nice technical lecture here, which I hope uh, you'll find useful. And if any of you sitting there thinking, I didn't understand that at all, that's one to a nice question that you can formulate for the technicians when you next have a workshop around aperture and uh, fast lenses and, and shallow depth of field. So photographs uh, have these codes, one of which is focus. And I think we can we can all agree with that. We don't necessarily always use focus in a way that as a, a mechanism to decode images. However, if you've ever been to a camera club or a local camera competition, you'll find that often one of the criteria for successful images will be, oh, it's sharp, sharp. Yes, that's a word they use. Oh, that's very sharp, that image, very, very much in focus. Uh, so they use those codes as a way to quantify the value of an image, maybe. Um, and sometimes they can say, you, you might hear someone say, it's a really good image, but it's a bit soft all over. And, and so they're using a technical code to make, shall we say, a, a, a kind of an aesthetic judgment, but then also maybe, maybe a, a cultural judgment, but they're not really picking that apart. And I think this is where, and we're going to talk about ideology later, but our, our kind of ideological transactions with images come in. So the way that we we say things without really um, understanding what we're saying. So we kind of say it as if it was a natural part of, oh yeah, we can all see that. Of course this image is brilliant because it's in focus. And yet maybe the, you know, maybe it's a, a questionable image in other terms, in terms of its content. So um, this is an online lecture, unfortunately, and normally I would ask you some questions about other photographic codes. So I'm not going to do that here because I know that it can be quite tricky online. I'd prefer just to sort of drive through this experience. So what we can say is that there are other photographic, purely photographic codes. And I think one of those is also um, the ability for pho photographs to freeze a moment in time and we've looked at images that have done that over the weeks and this is one of those images that I think encapsulates the code of photography in that sense the ability of photography to capture freeze a moment in time and that is unique in the sense of the way that photography does that so far shutter speed uh, capturing the the, the the kind of the the experience in front of the lens um, and I think if I was to discuss this image in terms of that code in terms of that photographic code so if I, I was to use this image to talk about photograph photography as a way of capturing the moment as a way of freezing the action as a way of um, 
making time stand still, I think you would all agree that I would be missing something of what this image does, of what this image says and what it speaks to. So this is going back to the, the, the camera club competition kind of argument that, that we can fixate on a code and ignore, as it were, the, 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 the meaning or the, the impact we say of of a particular image and 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 within that impact it will be the kind of historical context and subsequently the 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 as it were the the, the political or social impact of the image uh, as as seen so if we fixate too much on the technical side of photography we we do so we can do so at the expense of its cultural and social and historical importance. And that's why these lectures are kind of situated within your degree. And that's why it's important not to just become technically brilliant photographers and to disregard, as it were, the, the, um, the force of photography and what photography is doing. And because, as I've said to many of you before, right now, and by right now, you know, I mean a kind of period of epoch, not not today when um, Thursday, the 2nd of December. But right now, photography is undergoing a change, just like society is undergoing many changes, be, certainly because of the d digital revolution, but also because of all the technology, the platforms that we're using to share images uh, with or through. Um, that right now, photography is is undergoing a reconfiguration that, that you can be absolutely a part of and you can try and understand and be at the forefront of that and, and forge new pathways through the subject area, much more so than when I was studying when photography was really a very traditional modernist medium. Um, uh, so a medium simply a very analog and very much about kind of meaning and practice it, it combined whereas now we have this kind of complex idea of what photography is and what it does um, the pose is also a, a, a more universal code experienced in art and in life so we all pose in a particular way we have a way of posing and we see others posing uh, for us and around us so we interpret the pose of a subject in a photograph in a similar way to how we may interpret the pose of someone we see in the street. Think about the number of times you see people photographing themselves. We've talked about the selfie. Um, and so suddenly the camera is a performative gesture, uh, but, but also it's having an impact in, in the real world, even if you don't have your camera with you, or even if you don't, uh, you're not taking photographs, Others around you may well be doing that, so they're huddling together to be in a photograph, or maybe they're using, as I say, the selfie stick, or perhaps they're just smiling. You know, the, 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 the whole idea of the things that we do for the camera, the way that we perform. And the pose also has connotations in terms of sexuality, in terms of what we're trying to be attractive, or maybe, uh, um, present a particular image of ourselves. So the pose is an important code within photography and we can interpret it in, in, in uh, particular ways. I found this image on the internet, Gary Winogrand. Um, Gary Winogrand's usually associated with um, black and white images, particularly around New York. Um, in the 1950s and 1960s and and but I, I just found again this image quite arresting for all kinds of reasons and I, I, I think that it depicts in some ways the pose that, that I was kind of talk about but also it depicts this idea of where you can find something that interrupts your expectations so as I say Gary Winogrand well, is a photographer that, that I might refer to extensively in my lectures, but I would often refer to his black and white work and some of the more familiar images. So I wanted you to be aware that he, he's someone you might want to go and explore his, his, his body of work and you'll, you'll come across much more um, street photography, that documentary photography of New York over the 1950s and 1960s. Um, what all of this shows us, these codes, is how there are a range of different coded messages that we read in photographs. And we're doing this um, instantaneously. 
So it's, it's part of our knowledge, our learned experience. So we don't necessarily, unless we're judges in the camera club, we don't necessarily sit there and, and work through images through a checklist of, okay, what codes are going on here? Oh, we've got pose, oh, we've got uh, shallow depth of field, we've got black and white versus color, we've got portrait versus landscape, all of those, and we've got male without a top on, we've got, mm, you know, the codes of fashion photography here. Um, I, 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 I couldn't find a, a, a date for this image, by the way, sorry. Um, so uh, all of these codes show us a range of different coded messages that we read in photographs. We go through a process of decoding images in order that we come closer to understanding them. I think we, we circle around meaning. So we never come up against meaning in its, in its entirety. And what we do is we circle around it and gather meanings from from the photographs that we experience. Actually, you know, that's that's probably a universal point. We gather meaning um, in, in much of our life um, from from a range of sources. This this uh, decoding process is governed by a historical and cultural context. Those of the photograph and also our own historical and cultural context. And that, again, is another important thing for us to understand, that there, there isn't a universal answer here to what a photograph means. We bring to it something of ourselves, and it also brings something of itself to us, to the meaning. And those things then collide and join together if we are interpreting meaning in a kind of visual sense. So, Photographs are influenced by our age, by our gender, our class, our beliefs, all those kinds of things, our background. And in so many ways, it's difficult to assume any completely unified way of understanding a photograph. It becomes very subjective. And I'm sure you've, you've kind of come up against that subjective notion of, of photographs, either your own work or work that you've seen. So let's attempt, and this, this image was used by Victor Bergin in his essay, let's attempt some analysis of, of images as we go forward in the rest of this presentation. So how might we read this Diane Arbus photograph? So if we were in the room now, we, I would give you a copy of this image and you'd, you'd be looking at it in groups. So I, I, I'm going to do the, the heavy lifting for you. So, yeah, yeah. Um... My, I'm not sure if anyone else is the same, but mine's been stuck on the Gursky image. Oh, right. right. OK, that's that's bad news. Uh, can anyone else uh, can anyone else confirm or deny that? Yeah, mine was as well, but I didn't know whether it was my connection or not. So I was, I was oh, okay. not too sure. Right. OK, so let me just go back to where Gursky is. Um, I tell you what, let me, I'll come out of this meeting and come back in and see if we can reconfigure. <sighs> right, okay, hopefully, um, hopefully we'll be back um, where I left off. So I'll just quickly go back to my slides and let me just share my screen again. Again, if someone could shout and say, yes, slides and slides are moving, that'll be good. Oh, you made me so paranoid now. Um, OK, so these were the slides you missed. As I said, I'll, what I'll do is I'll go through the presentation and add these in to the recording when I edit it. And then we can have um, a better sense of what's going on. OK, so let's look at this image here, Diane Arbus. Um, some, and, and Bergen uses this image. Hopefully, can you see Diane Arbus? <laughs> Just someone uh, reassure me. Yes. Thank you, thank you. Um, as I said, I'm going to be paranoid now for the rest and all future presentations. Uh, so how might we read uh, Diana, this Diane Arbus photograph? So as I said, normally this would be for you guys to kind of uh, sit there and go, go through. Um, but essentially the subject of this image is the family. So you can, you, you can obviously get that visually, but you can also get it from the title, A Family on Their Lawn One Sunday in Westchester. Uh, New York in 1968, a photograph taken by Diane Arbus. So 
What we can see here is something of, um, as it were, a disruption of the idea of what the family is. So there's a, there's something that it's not the conventional idea of the family. So the normal representation of the family, and here I use the word normal in inverted commas or in, in italics, we see pictures of families, all kinds of different pictures of families, but this image is showing us a family, but but in a in a different way. So this is the kind of first approach that that, that uh, we might have for reading this image. Is is how does this and what does this tell us about the family in 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 some sense? Or what? How does this differ from our understanding of what the family is? And and in that difference comes, a, I guess, a sort of process through which we might challenge the notions of the family. Now, we don't necessarily only do this through photography. You know, we might do this through our own experience. So you've probably all sort of at times kind of gone, oh, hang on, you know, my life's not like that, or my, you know, my family aren't like this, or my, my experience doesn't meet the visual, um, the visual representation that I see. So this is about kind of coming up against what we might call the ideological um, construction of a family and then the the documented uh, vision of Diane Arbus of, of, of what the family actually is or what the, the family feels like or is represented as here. So I've used this picture before with you and it's just because I Google search, you know, ideal family picture. Um, so what's important, hopefully you can see a different picture now. Again, shout if you can't. Um, what, what is important to remember is that the basis of the feelings that we have about a photograph do not come from our individual responses, but from the common knowledge that we have of the typical representation of a particular situation. So this is the kind of common representation of the white male um, white sort of western um family the the nuclear family you know two kids a dog in a suburban setting etc cetera, etc cetera. so this is the kind of the ideological family not the lived family experience and i think we can you know th these are brutal kind of expressions of difference here so we can all um as it were live with the two things together or live with two things that that simultaneously operate in our understanding of image one is this idea that this doesn't really represent the family and then also this idea that we immediately recognize it as an image of a family so somehow even though we know that this isn't the family or a family that we even know about in our lived experience we still somehow understand it to be an image of a family because our notion, our idea of family has been pushed upon us, educated into us, framed through ad advertising and frame, framed through what we see on TV as the notion of the ideal family. And of course, everything then gets judged against this. So we then suddenly go, oh, my family was never like this. I was never this happy, blah, blah, blah. And we come up against all those kind of sociological and historical tensions that we might have uh, in, in, in our lives. So images bring to us something of, um, of an idea of, of what we might call ideology gives us a false sense of ideas about how something should or shouldn't be. Um, so I'm just going to shut the door because there's a bit of noise there on the left side. Okay. So the critical point here is uh, that photographs transmit what we refer to as ideology. So they transmit ideology. By this, I mean, in part, we begin to understand our own place and the place of others in, in a world, and the, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll read that again. We begin to understand our own place and the place of others in the world by how things are represented to us. Uh, so one way that ideology operates 
is in how we think things are natural or inevitable. So ideology is not your ideas. You may have been taught that previously, but ideology is not having an idea. Instead, ideology should be understood as a series of discourses, of, 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 of a ways that we appear to understand the world, but that ultimately push false ideas onto people. So ideology is discourse, it's structure that shapes the world that we experience, but it doesn't necessarily shape it in the way that it should be, um, in the way that it should be understood. So it's this false ideas, a kind of important part of ideology is its false nature. So when people buy into these false ideas, they develop what is known as, inverted commas, false consciousness about the world, about how it works and their place in it. So according to Karl Marx, who came up with this idea of false consciousness and ideology and ideology's role in, in delivering that, um, without ideology, no society could function for very long. So you could you're probably experiencing ideological uh, impacts on your life already and we could think about and i won't go into it because i'm not really sort of develop the idea too much here but you know the pandemic as the the um some of the rules and regulations that are being imposed on us are in some sense ideological some of them are backed up by science and i'm not saying that we shouldn't obey the rules but when we start to understand that if you like i think certainly in this country in the uk the confusion of some of the rules and regulations that we've experienced are um that confusion has emanated from an ideological position of the government of the day the tory government that we have so our government doesn't like to have a centralized control over society so it likes to impose or it likes people to uh, i think they use the words i was listening to steve baker yesterday and he was talking about how we shouldn't be wearing face masks because it should be all about our responsibility to choose now whatever side of the debate you sit on on the face masks and you know i've got face masks here so the, the, the i i you know i clearly wear face masks um but what Steve Baker is saying is that, well, oh, oh, we should choose. We don't have to be told this. We don't have to necessarily follow the science. We can decide for ourselves. Now, that is in some way ideological because actually we probably should follow the science because we're not scientists. So we don't necessarily know the science ourselves. We are not informed in the way that we should be so I'm, I'm kind of deviating from my talk here into a kind of political rant about wearing face masks or not what i'm trying to demonstrate to you is that ideology is in some sense the way in which some people might think wearing face masks is something we should do without question and i certainly think we should maybe question why we are wearing them that doesn't mean we shouldn't wear them uh, and then other people think, oh, we're just being kind of, it, it's, it's against our will and it's being imposed upon us. So ideology works in a kind of complex way of almost trying to make things seem um, more logical and more uh, natural than, than they necessarily are. Thus, we can consider it is ideological if we were think, to think of man or husband as the authority figure in the family or that women should look in a particular way. So those are ideological constructs. There's no naturalness for man. You know, we, we see now, you know, same sex marriages and, uh, and uh, uh, structures like that. Um, in fact, you know, marriage in itself is probably an ideological construct at, at the very beginning. So when we're talking about family, we might not we might think that the family is the normal thing to do. So you grow up and you kind of think, okay, get to a certain age, I'll meet someone, I'll get married, I will either be a husband or a wife, I will have children, I'll have a home, I'll have a job, 
All of those things are actually ideological, not natural, but they feel natural to you. Now, you're going to probably challenge me and go, oh, but hang on, that's society. That's, you know, that's the way our society is structured. That's natural. But Marx would say, no, that's ideological. Society doesn't have to be structured in this way. And actually, it wasn't structured in this way for many people for many hundreds or even thousands of years. And it's actually not structured in that way in other societies. So in other, you know, in other kind of parts of the world, uh, there isn't necessarily those structures. So think about ideology as the mechanism by which you think something is just normal and true. Uh, and actually, it's a construct of what we call discourses. So these ideas and thoughts and conversations. And by discourse, photograph, photographs are a, a formal discourse. So they are a language, as we talked about at the beginning of this lecture, a language which um, structures the way that we experience the world. So the way that we want to experience something is organized by those things. So the family is an ideological construct construct and there is no real reason why the family unit exists in the format that it does other than to shall we say reinforce the economic uh, um, goals of, of of capitalism in some sense and that's not in total but it certainly does operate in that way we could talk about other ideological constructs. The school is another one. So the school is organized around uh, factories and around going to work. And the way that, although school disrupts some of that, um, you know, the, the idea that you go into school Monday to Friday, nine to five, and you know you sit in a classroom at desks and there's a teacher at the front, it's, it's a way of organizing you into a kind of factory way of working later on when you when you um, uh, come out of school. So there, there are kind of similarities there. Okay, I'm moving on to another slide. Wolfgang Tillmans. Um, if, you, if you're not seeing Wolfgang Tillmans, you can shout and I will try and address that. But hopefully you're seeing Wolfgang Tillmans. So, so what follows is a way to approach image analysis. Firstly, what you must remember is that in any analysis of images, you're not looking for the secret be hidden behind an image. I think that's something that we often get caught in, this idea, what, what is this image telling us? There is no truth lurking behind images waiting to be unveiled. The project of analysis is not to penetrate an image so that we can get to a truth that it's masking over. What we must do is try to explain why an image takes the form that it does. So what, what we should be asking is what things have contributed to its construction and its making. And here I'm not just asking technical questions, but actually cultural, social and historical questions. So here is Wolfgang Tillman's image that takes as their start point the representation of light and colour using photography. So the subject matter of Tillman's work varies considerably. If you go to a Tillman's exhibition, you'll see all kinds of different things that he photographs. But what we can see here, just in these three images, is something of what I referred to in my previous lecture about Clement Greenberg's idea of modernism. So the work begins to reflect upon something of itself. Here we can understand Tillman's work as expressing some of the qualities of the medium of photography, i.e. painting with light, photography, painting with light. So Tillmans is looking at light as a quality of photography and is using photography to examine that particular quality. Okay. This image, uh, Philip Lorca de Corsia. Um, and I'm just gonna quote here from, um, from the web actually. Uh, about about um, uh, Philip Lawson de, de Corsier. So American photographer emerged in the 1980s as part of a generation of photographers who sought to explore and challenge the boundaries of the medium. Familiar kind of term there. Over the past three decades, he's become known for his meticulously planned and executed photographs involving a variety of individuals, including friends, relatives, anonymous strangers, pole dancers, and street hustlers, 
among others. Deploying his subjects in preconceived yet sim seemingly random positions and contexts, de Corsia's images are far from candid snapshots, but rather they explore the tension between the casual and the posed, the accidental and the fated, at once documentary and theatrical. His work operates in the interstices, interstices, interstices of fact and fiction. Sorry, I didn't say that word correctly. So here we have an image that is looks like it's a documentary street photography image. It, it takes on some of those codes. And yet we know, or we can understand a little bit more once we we do some analysis that this image is a constructed image. So it's it's posed, it's theatrical, it's performed. So it's starting to play with some contradictions of photography. The idea of street photography, maybe street photography is one of the genres of photography that kind of exemplifies photography itself. The idea that we go out onto the street and photograph what's there. Can't really do that as a painter. Mm, can probably do it as a filmmaker. I mean, yeah, people use their phones now, don't they, to, to make images of what's going on. Um, so it's, it's part of shall we say, photographic imaging, the, the all-encompassing horizon of photographic image. So that's a quote from his gallery website there. But um, it it's expresses the idea that, um, that we're using or we can use photography as a way to look at that tension between the candid snapshot and the performed setup image. And that brings me on to this photograph. Hopefully you're seeing Jeff Wall milk. Uh, Jeff Wall, so Jeff Wall, we looked at his work before and his images are very much in the field of artwork. So large photographs, often uh, backlit transparency images. And um, I'll just read a quote from, this is from the Tate um, exhibition of Jeff Wall. So this image is called Milk. Hopefully you can see Milk there. So Milk is another depiction of a socially charged subject. Milk being the title of the image. Suffering and dispossession remain at the centre of social experience, Wall has commented. The explosive burst of light is embl emblematic of the man's state of mind. But what might have provoked such extreme emotion is not revealed. A state of ambiguity that ensures the work cannot be understood as moral commentary. The process of reconstructing an event allows Wall the freedom to reinvent the composition. He often relocates the action to a different setting, a place chosen for its formal or pictorial qualities, as is the case here. The grid-like order of the brick wall background and strong vertical bands that stripe the left side of the image contrast sharply with the tension in the man's arms and the uncontrolled arc of milk. So that was Tate interpreting that image. So they were taking a very formalist um, approach to, to understanding this image. So they, they, they recognize that what Jeff Wall does is he reconstructs things that he's seen or, or ideas that, that he has. Um, so I've got some quotes here from Jeff Wall himself talking about this image. So he says, so this is a quote from Jeff Wall. I think I'm drawn to forms above all forms and colors, uh, all kinds of forms and colors. But there's something particularly compelling about forms and shapes that have been caused by fluid flows, whether water or air. And he's kind of referring to this image and some other work that he's got. The explosion of milk, this is Wall speaking, in the picture milk, is an acute example of liquid flow causing a shape to exist for an instant before your eyes because of what photography alone can do. I'll just repeat that. The explosion of milk in the pitcher milk is an, exa an acute example of liquid flow causing a shape to exist for an instant before your eye eyes because of what photography alone can do. So Jeff Wall is in some way expressing something about photography here in the way that I looked at with uh, the previous images. Um, 
because he's saying that photography captures that moment, the moment of the milk uh, com coming out of the, the uh, container there. Now, now there's other readings, other codes within this image. If you're familiar with American culture, the, the, uh, they usually wrap alcohol in, uh, in brown paper bags so you can't see it. So when you're sold alcohol, it's, it, it comes in a brown paper bag. And you can see the milk there in this picture is wrapped in a brown paper bag. So the, there's an interpretation of this image that could go down that route around the, 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 the person in the image being a, um, a, a, someone begging on the street, you know, drinking from a drinking alcohol. So we could have all kinds of symbolic uh, semiotic readings um, uh, of this image uh, in some way, or we can have this kind of interpretive image uh, reading that, 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 that understands it as an image about photography itself. Let's return now to uh, Claudia Engelmeyer, uh, who I've showed you her, her work before as well, and this is the same piece. Um, I've deliberately chosen this work and I return to it because of what I've said about there being no truth behind an image. So I'm using it metaphorically to articulate my point. Uh, um, and, and it's many of the things that I'm interested in about photography and art. So this idea of what's behind the work. And here you can see the installation of Engelmeyer's work. If you remember, it's she photographs the other side of art postcards that you get in galleries. So she photographs the, the, the back end, presumably probably on a light box. You can kind of see the image behind the the uh, photo, the postcard, but you can also see what's on the postcard itself. And then these are blown up very large as hopefully you can see in the installation shot. So I feel that Engelmeyer's work expresses a kind of tension in this direction, the direction of art and what is the meaning behind work. Or at least it illustrates a notion of behind an image, this behindness, that I'm encouraging you to avoid or to question. So avoid the notion of what is behind. You're not trying to find a truth or a meaning. What we see here, I'll go back to Engelmeyer's Betty, is large-scale photographic images showing photographs of books, postcards, and transparencies that show copies of the master pieces of art history. So Engelmeyer's work, Betty, from her series Works on Paper, at on first glance looks like a pale, bleached image that vaguely resembles an almost invisible shape of a woman. In contrast, the clear German writing follows the format of contemporary art postcards. Immediately, two contradictory elements are held together formally. The scale of the image, denoting the photograph's connection to painting and art history, and that this is a postcard, the sort found in an art gallery bookshop. This kind of postcard is inevitably a copy of an original painting or artwork at a reduced scale. Formally, what this work shows um, simultaneously, so formally as in the form of it, is the back and front of the postcard. We see both things at the same time. It privileges the reverse side of the image, yet acknowledges the representational ambiguity and quality of the art postcard form. Here's the original painting uh, by Gerhard Richter of Betty, um, painted in 1988. The original painting depicts the transitional status of a child to adolescent. Richter made his painting from a photograph of his daughter. So we have a transition there from, paint, from photograph to painting back to photograph of a postcard. The technique of placing an image inside another image is known as a maison abemi. Within Engelmeyer's Betty, Abim, that is, should, should be, sorry. Uh, within Engelmeyer's Betty are the images that brought it into being. We have then a trajectory that passes from the, the original photograph to Richter's paintings, to a postcard, to Engelmeyer's photographic work. So we have this trajectory, the original photograph, Richter's painting, the postcard, 
to Ankomar's photographic work. The effect of reproduction or representation are apparent in much of Angomar's work. With Betty, as I've said, there's the, histori the history of different representational forms. And in this work, Hass, which is the German word for rabbit, uh, we can see a deliberate juxtaposition of duplicate printed images. So these images are kind of presented together. So Ang here, Angomar's conceptual gesture follows Marcel Duchamp and his reproductions of his own work in a box in a suitcase, what M. Valais. And this is also replicated in Sherry Levine's after Rochenko. So Rochenko being the photographer, and what Sherry Levine did is re-photograph uh, classic photographs of Rochenko and then presented them as as her own work in 1987. So what we see here is a kind of self-referential um, move by this kind of work. So what, and, and finally, Eric, Eric Kessel's work, My Feet. So what, what might all these references to representation or representation say about the practice of photography? One answer is how photographs are not specific things in their own right, but should be understood as a series of equivalences. So strangely, they are equivalent to each other as well as the things that they depict. So that's a kind of move now that we're seeing where photography starts to refer to itself, which is back to that modernist Clement Greenberg thing about art talking about itself, photographs start to refer back to each other. Many artists such as Eric Kessels now take as their subject how photography operates in terms of equivalences. In the digital world, and by this I mean the period where photographic growth was exponential, it became apparent that while we may look at photographs for all the reasons I have described at the beginning of the lecture, the kind of environment thing, there is also something symptomatic, Photograph, photography as a symptom of something else about why it is that we take so many photographs. So I like this idea of the photograph as a symptom, the idea that it is actually representing something else in us. The cough is a symptom of COVID, of course, uh, nowadays. The photograph is a symptom of our desire to represent the world continuously. Another Eric Kessel's image in almost every picture, number one. So I'm just going to read a quote here from Eric Kessel's website. So in, and this is the quote, in almost, in almost every picture, number one, is a collection of hundreds of photographs taken by a husband of his wife during the years 1956 to 1968. They are remarkable for their consistency. They are relaxed, but arranged, amateur, and professional at the same time. Every day, yet unique. The wife is the center of the picture and gracefully poses in almost every picture. During 12 years, we travel with her to different places. We see her age and her hairstyle change. So, sorry, we see her age and her hairstyles change. So does her taste in fashion. The collection was found in a flea market in Barcelona, and eventually they did actually trace the original owner of these images, so the, 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 the husband and wife. So here we can see how photographs, so that's the end of the quote, here we can see how photographs track time. They, they map out our lives. They do not do, um, they, they do what we do not do. They hold our image frozen in time. It might seem that to photograph is to try to resist the inevitable pull of time. However, I suggest photo we photograph in order to allow time to pass, in order to continue toward our future. The extreme of this is in how we now pass our time by looking at photographs, by scrolling and swiping, by sharing and liking. As the title of this lecture recalls, 
we look at photographs again and again. So I just want to reiterate my point that I'm making there. Photogra photographs try to resist the inevitable pull of time, but I suggest that we photograph in order to allow time to continue, to allow it to pass. Because once we photograph, we can then move on, as it were. We, we have done the work of capturing time and then we move on. This is a photograph of uh, Amelia Ullman, experience, uh, Excellences and Perfections. And again, I will quote from, um, I believe this is uh, from The Guardian, actually. Um, so, on the 19th of April 2014, Amelia Ullman uploaded an image of her, image to her Instagram account, of the words part one in black serif lettering on a white background. The caption read cryptically, excellences and perfections. It received 28 likes. For the next several months, she conducted a scripted online performance via Instagram and Facebook profiles. As part of this project titled Excellences and Perfections, Ullman underwent an extreme semi-fictionalized makeover. She pretended to have a, have, have a breast augmentation, posting images of herself in a hospital gown with a bandaged chest, using a padded bra and Photoshop to manipulate her images. Other elements of her makeover were not feigned. She followed uh, Zarda, the Zardar diet strictly, probably I've said that wrong, sorry, uh, for example, and she went to pole dancing lessons often. Ullman conceived of excellences and perfections as a boycott of her own online persona. And for three months, she allowed her profiles to be exactly what social media seems to demand that she be, a hot babe in quotation marks. So here, what we see with Ullman's work is, is that um, inversion of the secret. So there is no secret. It's all a performance. There, this did not happen. These are photographs of the things that did not happen. So I try to return to that question of analysis that avoids trying to find the secret behind an image. There is no secret to Omen other than the fact that this is a body of work, that she is subverting the ideas of what she should be, of what images as an environment, as we go back to the beginning of this presentation, as an environment, images try to inform us, try to tell us what we should be, who we should be, how we should be, in order to be ourselves. As I stated earlier, what we need to ask is not what is the hidden message, but why was this photograph taken in this way? Why did the things we see in this photograph become a photograph? And why are there so many of them? And I think these are really the questions. I'm not, my, my lecture won't necessarily answer this in this way, but this is for you to go and reflect on why are there so many photographs taken today? And why did this photograph become a photograph? Okay, so, we are familiar today with the idea of the network. I think it's, it, it's something which, which we've talked about a little bit at the beginning of this lecture. So a network is a set of relations between things. So we can, can consider a photograph as a point of connection between the different objects they depict and also between each photograph in and of themselves. So each photograph connects with the, another photograph. Um, the result, and this is a quote here, the result of our explorations is, uh, and this is from Lev Manovich's work on Broadway, the result of our explorations is on Broadway. So this idea of the networked connected images, a visually rich image centric interface where numbers play only a secondary role and no maps are used. The project proposes a new visual metaphor for thinking about the city a vertical stack of images and data layers created from the activities and me media shared by hundreds of thousands of people. 
Images and data include 660,000 Instagram photographs shared along Broadway during six months in 2014. So this is quite an old project. Twitter posts with images for, from the same period, Google Street View images, over 8 million Foursquare check-ins, uh, 22 million taxi pickups and drop-offs, and income averages for the part of uh, the city uh, crossed by Broadway from a US Census group Bureau. Uh, bureau. So what this work does is it encapsulates all these things together in a kind of data visualization of what image is. So when I say what what is the form of image and why why do we make so many images now? What Manovich has done is kind of encapsulated the data, the data of society, the data of our interactions, and express those through the images that we make, through the images that we make at a particular point in time. So I'm coming to the uh, the last slide here now. So to return to Claudia Engelmeyer, there are a number of ways I can read her images or use her images to support ideas. I fo focused on a particular route um, around around this idea of the metaphor, but, but, but there are other things I could have explored in more detail, the relationship to art history, or to perhaps uh, have explored the conceptual behind notion of the other side of images. So what I'm encouraging you to do for your writing is to think about photography and photographs in a particular way. And this will underpin your writing for this module and for the dissertation which will begin in September. You need to embrace this idea of what the formal idea of photography is. So why, why is it that images take the form that they do and how do they express photography in the way that they present themselves to you okay um that's the end of my lecture have you got any questions so, sorry about the technical difficulties at the beginning and i'm sure i will try and kind of edit through this and make it a little bit more coherent um with the slides any any questions from anyone No. OK, <laughs> I'll take that as a no. Um, I'll leave you all to the rest of your uh, Thursday then. Um, as I said, I'll stick this recording up, probably do a re-edit on that so that we can include the slides and you can go back through through those images um, uh, as and when you feel like it. Any questions, if you want to email me, that, that, that that's fine as well. Uh, thank you for listening and say sorry about the uh, the uh, the first good half of that that presentation being a bit bit um, beset by uh, internet problems or, or technical issues with teams. Okay, thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you, John. Thank you. See ya. Goodbye. Bye.